How do thermobaric or vacuum bombs actually work? Well, the first thing we need to do is stop calling them vacuum bombs. I'm going to call them thermobaric or fuel air explosives from here on out. You'll see why we shouldn't call them vacuum bombs as I explain what they are, and we can start with grain. You know, once in a while, grain silos just explode. This happens about eight times a year in the United States. The last one was in May of 2021 in Idaho, and there was an explosion in Canada back in May of 2021. So why do grain silos just explode, and what does this have to do with fuel air explosives? Well, fine grain dust is combustible, and you tend to get a lot of grain dust, especially when you're moving it around on conveyors. When grain dust mixes with the oxygen in the air, then all you need is a spark, flame, or static electricity to cause all of that fuel to oxidize rapidly and cause an explosion. Thermobaric weapons work the same way. The warhead works in two stages. First, the warhead splits apart, releasing fuel into the environment. The fuel mixes with the oxygen in the environment, working its way into the cracks of buildings or the openings of bunkers. About 40 milliseconds later, a detonation causes the fuel to ignite. This causes a massive fireball and overpressure. This can be devastating, especially inside of a building or a bunker where the fire and explosion has no place to go. The temperature can get up to 1,000 degrees Celsius. But what if we wanted to increase the blast and thermal damage even more? A mixture of powdered aluminum, boron, and magnesium hydride can be added to the aerosol. The high heat combustion of the boron combined with the hydrogen released from the magnesium hydride can actually increase the overpressure and get the temperature of the flame up to 1700 degrees Celsius. This is roughly 30% of the temperature of the surface of the sun. So where does this vacuum part come from when it just seems like we have a fireball and some overpressure? Well, maybe some people consider it a vacuum because it sucks up all the oxygen for use in the explosion. Or maybe it's because as the gas is cool from the explosion, denser air rushes in to fill that void. But it doesn't create a vacuum like you're stepping out an airlock into space. If you were close enough to the explosion that any air you were breathing was sucked up by the fireball, you're probably getting burned by the fireball and squished by the blast. So lack of oxygen is the least of your problems. Now, Russia uses the TOS-1 as its main vehicle for deploying thermobaric weapons. They actually call them rocket-propelled flamethrowers, and what's weird is that they're not actually part of the brigade artillery. They're actually part of the Nuclear, Biological, and Chemical Defense Company as their own platoon of flamethrowers. Russia also uses the RSHG-1, which is a thermobaric rocket. This weapon has a pretty unique tandem warhead where it has a high explosive anti-tank round up at the front, which will cut through enemy armor, and then it has a follow-up charge of a thermobaric warhead, which will push its way through the crack made by the high explosive anti-tank round and detonate that fuel inside the tank or a bunker causing a catastrophic explosion. The United States also uses thermobaric weapons. They were used pretty extensively during the early part of Afghanistan to attack cave complexes. Uh, the BLU-109 is now used in this role. And the United Kingdom used modified Hellfire missiles with thermobaric warheads in Syria fired from drones. So all that being said, thermobaric weapons seem pretty devastating. Is the use of thermobaric weapons a war crime? Not really. I mean, as long as these weapons are used against valid military targets, they're really no different than any other explosive or incendiary. In fact, the International Committee of the Red Cross doesn't even mention them. So that's thermobaric weapons. They're really not as exotic as the news would like you to think, and the theory of operation is really no different than a grain silo explosion. Now, I do want to end this with a question and a request. While I was doing the research for this video, I started to wonder if the ambient humidity or rain could affect the power of a thermobaric warhead. And I really couldn't get a good answer. I mean, when you think about it, if it's raining or it's very humid, the air is more dense. So that should make the shock wave more destructive. But the rain and the water vapor is displacing oxygen in the environment. But maybe it's not displacing that much. I don't know the answer to that. But if you know the answer to that, let me know on my website down below. Or if you're a physicist, a chemist, a meteorologist, or you know a lot about explosives, I would love to do another video where we go out to a site and we try some explosions in uh, very humid air and see if there's a difference. Contact me down on my website and let me know. Thank you for watching.